Hi everyone and welcome to another Digital Twins session. My name is Adam Beck. Uh, I am Executive Director of the Smart Cities Council uh, and Secretariat for the Centre for Data Leadership, which our Digital Twin work falls under. Uh, session number six today and we have joining us Melissa Harris from Victoria, Department of, I've got to get this right, Environment, Land, Water and Planning. Delp Good job, Delp. Adam. Yep, that's it. <laughs> Welcome, Melissa. Thanks for joining us. Um, let's start with who you are and what you do. What can you tell us? Well, I'm the Executive Director with the Victorian Government um, working for Delp, as you explained. And I lead a large division of around 270 um, property and land professionals that have a wide range of statewide responsibilities, primarily in the areas of um, property valuations, land surveying, spatial services, and government land advice. Um, I'm also privileged to be the Deputy Chair of the Land Information Council of Australia and New Zealand, which is called ANSLIC. Um, and in terms of my background, I've worked in the property industry um, in state and local government for almost 30 years now. Time goes quickly. I um, started out initially as a town planner, and I've been involved over the years in a lot of key planning reform initiatives, many of which have had a, a technology and transformation focus, um, before making my way up the executive ranks to my current position, which I've been in for almost two years. I didn't realise you were a fellow planner. I mean, it all makes sense now. That's fantastic. <laughs> that's, that's fantastic. Yeah. Um, and uh, just for note, for those that are watching um, Melissa's... Um, extracurricular activity that she mentioned there in terms of her involvement with Anslink, um, very much recommending that everyone uh, go to their browser and Google Anslink Digital Twin. There's some amazing work that was published late last year in the form of a set of principles, which we'll talk a little bit uh, about later. Um, so, Melissa, let's kick off with, um, with sort of your view on the world when it comes to digital twins. Um, this is our sixth interview with digital twin leaders. Um, many different flavours and um, sectors and um, interpretations. Uh, you, you come from a, uh, you know, a, a particular sort of background. Talk to us about the value of Digital Twin and the opportunities from, from your perspective. Oh, look, it's hard to know where to begin, Adam. I mean, for me, Digital Twins are quite simply a digital representation of the real world. And I know that um, some people might think that definition simplistic, but when you think about how complex the real world is, I think that it's incredible to think that a digital platform um, has the potential to replicate that complexity and provide enhanced decision support for so many aspects of our day-to-day -day lives. So, um, and look, I often hear about you know, digital twins and the fact they've been around for decades. And I'm sure that's the case. I certainly haven't been working with them for that long. But for me, when I talk about digital twins, it's really about the spatially enabled variety. So um, it's using these 3D digital models of buildings or assets or whatever, and combining them with ubiquitous spatial information to provide really rich um, context and to support enhanced place-based decision-making. So that's what I think is the magic of um, digital twins. And, you know, that spatial information is where me and my department come in, in Victoria and ANSLIC at the national level. Um, so we call this spatial information the foundation data sets. And it's a really serious responsibility that each of the jurisdictions has in Australia and New Zealand. And it includes things like, um, state map bases, so the representation of um, property boundaries, roads, vegetation, imagery, elevation, addressing, and more recently, uh, the foundation data set model has been expanded to include buildings and infrastructure. So you can start to see that all of these things together are the essential building blocks for a digital twin. So we've been experimenting with digital twins for about 12 months now, and for me, every time I look at our digital twin or someone else's digital twin, I'm incredibly struck by the power of just seeing so much data and information in one place at one time. So in our particular case, we have around a thousand data sets in our platform now. And when you think of the trouble that you'd have to go to um, as a decision maker to access that information 
using traditional mechanisms compared to the power that you have of integrated shared information in a centralised location that you can visualise in 3D and 4D. And you really just have this superior decision making capability that you wouldn't otherwise have. So that's for me where the, the real value is. And to me, it's just coming at this perfect time in terms of the development of you know, Australia's capital cities. Um, they're under so much pressure in terms of livability and managing increasing density. And yet, despite that fact and the fact that you know, the complexity of that our decision makers are dealing with is increasing. You know, the tool sets that we have really haven't changed much in decades. Um, it is more often the case than not that, you know, there's a heavy reliance on paper, scale rulers, you know, mountains of information of rules and really low tech tools to manage what is becoming incredibly, you know, um, complex and high stakes um, decision making. So, and then that's sort of coupled with the fact that, you know, you know, just a lot of decisions, so if you take the planning process, for example, decisions are made at a particular point in time, sometimes in isolation, and, and of course, cities are li living, breathing ecosystems, they're highly changeable and interconnected, and managing that complexity is, is really, really challenging. So, you know, I think it's a responsibility of, of people to be really receptive to new ways of working and thinking and using digital methods, such as digital twins, to really increase our chances of getting, um, getting it right, which is what I think this work is doing really well. Um, you know, I suppose expanding on some of the benefits, you know, it's really good for collaboration, for co-designing outcomes, for increasing um, community understanding or just understanding of the lay people who really struggle to understand the impact of changes until it's upon them. Yeah. Um, and we're getting lots of value for, um, you know, much better public value for our data, which, which is always important as well. I, um, I, the, the beauty of my job is that sort of, I don't, I'm not a digital twin person or data person. I get to sort of float above it all. My, my entree into digital twin, however, was kind of from a built environment buildings, BIMI kind of world. Um, and only stumbled across Anslick and the work of Anslick, of course, last year. And I had the benefit of meeting you and your sort of, um, counterparts in, uh, in other States. Um, and have uh, have certainly grown to not only sort of understand but appreciate the spatial the spatial enablement spatially enabled part of this conversation um and i kind of i remember there was that light bulb moment for me where i've gone huh yeah you know without it being spatially grounded it's kind of just something floating in space right you know and i thought Absolutely. oh that would be a bit of a dumb digital twin um, and so for me, the learning process and understanding um, that just genuine idea of, of, of grounding the digital twin, you know, in, into the ground is, is pretty critical. Um, I'm, I'm going to sort of extend my, my, my sort of um, stroking of your ego there for a moment and say it's actually been yourself in, in terms of Victoria, Queensland, um, New South Wales, who have been driving, you know, this spatially enabled digital twin sort of agenda nationally for us over the last year or two. Can you, um, can you share with me how you're engaging, interacting with those that bring the space, uh, the, the, the digital twin sort of stuff that comes on top, you know, the, the, the infrastructure sector, you know, horizontal vertical infrastructure, your, your fellow departments, but also private sector. Um, how, how, how is sort of that engagement and collaboration working with sort of those, those other parts that interact with the spatial elements? Yeah, it's a good question, Adam. And I could talk for a long time about some of that, but in fact, I think I might start though by saying one of the best uh, things we've found through um, our digital twin project in Victoria has obviously been the learnings around capability and how to really push the limits of the technology. But there's a really big people piece to it as well. So quite early on, we um, got a group of who we, people that we thought were technology um, innovators in this space together. And it was just a sort of a, a random assortment of people from across 
different areas of the Victorian government and local councils in Victoria. And we all got together monthly throughout most of last year to really share learnings, um, to get their insight and input. And it, the group has just grown bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's now got a standing invitation list of about 60, 60 plus people. Uh, we had our first meeting for the year uh, only a couple of weeks ago and just the breadth of organisations represented, the, the, lev the groundswell of interest um, is incredibly good. And the other thing that I was incredibly struck by, so this time 12 months ago, was really only us talking on the agenda, sharing the stuff that we're doing and our bright ideas for the project. Um, but, you know, we're now at a point, a mere 12 months later, where we've got people competing to be on the agenda to show us their <laughs> work. So, Organisations like Melbourne Water, the planning department in DELP, um, and of course, brilliant work happening in our digital engineering community in Victoria using BIM as a result of the infrastructure program. So, um, look, we are starting to collaborate more and more with um, a broader set of stakeholders than are the traditional spatial stakeholders. Um, so, the architecture and engineering and construction professions are a great example of that. Um, and I think in recognition of that, when we prepared the um, digital twin principles last year and reset the ANSLIC strategy for the next four years, we were really keen to engage very widely with a broad set of stakeholders to make sure that this work would stand the test of time and represent the needs of this broader cohort as we could possibly engage with. So I think mm. it's good. Um, I did present, I had the honour of presenting at Mel BIM a few weeks back. I think it was early March. Yeah, time's a little bit fuzzy at the moment, it is isn't a bit it? Fuzzy. <laughs> it was the last time I left the house. Um, and, um, you know, I was just staggered by the size of that community in Victoria. It was nearly 700 people. Wow. Just come along for a networking event, incredibly enthusiastic, so much talent, and, you know, rivers of data to be mm. honest. Um, so, yeah, so we're doing what we can and um, very, very encouraged by, by what we're seeing. And of course, you know, on the digital engineering side, just one final point I think is um, we're seeing huge capability there because of the money the government's investing in our infrastructure program. It's a $107 billion program, the biggest one in our history. And the capability lift that we're seeing in the way um, that infrastructure is being designed and delivered is really remarkable. And it's a, it's a, you know, once in a generation yeah. opportunity, we really need to sort of figure out how to harness those learnings and embed them so we get the benefit moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. Now, you, now you've mentioned, you've made reference to your project a couple of times now. I assume you're talking about Fisherman's Bend uh, as, as one of those. Yeah. Um, where are we at? What's happening? What can you share? Okay, so, um, well, our Fisherman's Bend Digital Twin project kicked off, I'd say, about June last year. And we, it's a project we're um, undertaking in partnership with um, Melbourne University, the CS Diller Group, who um, are the spatial um, and land administration experts in Melbourne University. And um, so the background to that is that one of the foundation data sets is the property um, layer. And I'm leading a large project at the moment, which is about $45 million in value to digitise the map base for Victoria. As in the, as in the entire state? The entire state, all 3.1 million parcels. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's an incredibly precious data set and it's used you know, hundreds of thousands of times every day or week by the community, by government um, to do all manner of place-based things. But it's the problem with it is it's a, an analog format and it's not very precise. So the $45 million digital cadastre modernization project is to um, digitize all of that into a, um, an XML format and increase the, the um, accuracy of it. So it sort of stands us in good stead as we move into this high precision digital future. So that's going to take us quite some time, several years, in fact, um, and it's a huge project in, and in itself. But what we were interested to do was to look at early examples of the kind of innovation that that investment would unlock. And then we started to think about, well, how else do we need to lead the modernisation of our foundation data sets in Victoria to support that innovation? So 
The Digital Twin Project um, was born. It's effectively um, a bit of an R&D project, if you can think of it in those terms. It's how we um, experiment with some of these emerging technologies and think about how we can embed new capabilities into the um, management and distribution of the foundation data sets. And the reason we chose Fisherman's Ben, we thought, well, we're gonna be doing some pretty cool stuff. Mm. We might as well use a really um, high value use case. And Fisherman's Bend, of course, is um, the largest urban renewal precinct in Australia. It's, um, by the time it's finished, it's gonna be something like twice the size of the Melbourne CBD. It's gonna be enormous. So we thought, you know, if we could use this digital platform to assist decision makers in um, unfolding, you know, that precinct, it would be a good thing. So, um, so we're a few months in, we sort of, um, the first lot of sprints, it's an agile project, sort of took us up to Christmas. Then we sort of had a look at it and thought, oh no, we might keep going, do a few more sort of things. Um, so it's the current sprints is uh, um, planned to come to an end in a couple of weeks. And from there, we'll think about how we open up access to at least the stakeholders in the project and potentially to the public, depending on um, if we can get that sort of authorization access um, model right. But, the, you know, the kind of things that we're doing, um, just to give you some examples, we acquired our first very high resolution 3D aerial imagery for the precinct. So that's two centimetres of resolution in 3D form, if you can imagine. Wow. Yeah, boggling clarity and all data driven. Um, we're also using it to experiment with machine learning. So to use some of our traditional 2D data sets to create rich 3D objects. So um, we've created a 3D data set of trees in Fisherman's Bend. So canopy covers considered to be one of the success criteria of the precinct. So with these 3D objects, you can do all sorts of calculations around, you know, as I said, canopy cover, um, you know, all manner of things. Um, and these are things which historically weren't practical or affordable for us to do, and which through the development of new technology and machine learning are now within our reach. So we're really, really interested in um, learning this and applying the learnings to the um, creation of these new data sets. And then the other side of it obviously is BIM. So we've been doing a lot of work um, and building our capability and our experience in interacting with BIM models. Um, so we've been very lucky enough to um, be given access to some incredibly, um, I think they're beautiful um, models. So some examples are the new Melbourne University campus design, which has been done by Len Lease. Um, so that's shaping up as a world leading engineering campus. So it's incredibly, um, serendipitous that potentially that could be sort of a, a you know a world leading example of um of 3d and digital engineering and everything that a digital twin is um, we've also got the fisherman's bend vertical school bim model which is also a really innovative um, proposal and we've been lucky to get some of the um, bim models for some of the high-rise buildings from the applicants and with that we're experimenting with sort of dropping them into uh, you know, pulling out the old building, putting in the new one, very much like a digital Lego kit, if you can imagine. Um, we've been also experimenting with 3D cadaster because, of course, what that means is um, because so much of um, so much property is now in high-rise form, increasingly we're needing to look at how we represent property ownership in 3D form, which sounds quite easy when you say it quickly, but it's incredibly difficult. Mm. To do. So we're doing a lot of research in in that. Um, area. We've um, incorporated some live data into it. So it's incredibly exciting to be looking at a BIM model in amongst some 3D planning controls and to see a, a tram trundling through the precinct. Um, and we've also got some live traffic feeds from the Westgate Freeway and other main roads. And then probably lastly, um, the, we've, we're experimenting with different algorithms because of course all of this is great, if, but it's got to really add value. And so we're trying to sort of experiment with algorithms that do some of the heavy lifting that humans currently do at the moment and which take longer than they could otherwise. So, um, so you know, automatically calculating compliance of new developments with overshadowing um, requirements is an example. So instead of, you know, just having the building and having the shadow, you know, give it the pass fail sort of assessment without having to do all of the thinking. Um, 
And, and another example is, is viewing some of the planning controls in 3D form. So um, if you look at planning controls at the moment, they take a lot of words to say something as simple. <laughs> can't build more than 10 stories. Um, so just sort of having a building envelope in 3D and then putting a building in it, and all of a sudden you just have these insights that you don't have in a 2D paper-based world. So there's some examples. Yeah, I, uh, I, and I'm sure you'd appreciate this as sort of a, a, a planner as well, that, you know, if I, you know, if I go back 10, 20 years, I, I'm sort of remembering vaguely how we used to write about this stuff, you know, the development should do this. And we'd sort of rattle off all these sort of things that we'd like it to do and maximize tree canopy coverage. And that's a good metric. And now thinking that kind of potentially in the blink of an eye in real time, visualize that we can now make that happen. Um, mm. and, and I think also the, the, the layering up of data sets and with the internet of things and our ability to sense more and more things in real time, it, it's kind of a, a bit mind blowing. Um, so from that, a question comes to mind. I'd love your thoughts on it. Um, so, so we've built the Ferrari. We're holding the keys. Um, where do you think we're at and, 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 what's sort of important in the short terms in terms of um, the collective we building a digital twin sort of level of literacy that allows us to really understand the value. And I suppose for me, digital twin being a data platform, right? It's all about data. Um, is that sort of leadership there yet more broadly across the nation? What's your sort of view on those issues on our, readiness and ability and maturity to kind of really unlock the value that that this data and of course the platform can play for us now yeah look um i mean i think you know i think i had my first presentation on bim back in 2004 so we certainly couldn't say that you know 3d and digital building models have been an overnight success but yeah. you know sometimes these things just take a long time to reach critical mass and and one of the great things, you know, when you talk to lay people or upper levels of government who aren't necessarily from a technology background about data, they you can see their sort of, you know, um, eyes glaze over. But if you show them, you know, rich, you know, visually rich 3D um, objects or settings, all of a sudden it's a yeah. different proposition. So that's one of the really compelling things I've noticed. I'm noticing is that this work, despite the fact it's a technology piece resonates with a much wider audience and that's fantastic for technical literacy uptake and understanding. So, um, look, you know, I suppose in terms, I've got, you know, in Victoria, we're very practical about the fact, you know, we're not Singapore, we don't have $85 million to build a massive, you know, statewide digital twin. Um, but, you know, I don't know that it's actually needed or would be all that helpful at the moment. I think there's a lot that can be done just in terms of standardising, managing and curating things that are already happening um, and, you know, distributing and storing them centrally as part of the foundation data sets where that's sensible and really starting to power an ecosystem of digital twins that are potentially can interoperate um, that way. And, and, you know, so with the experience of Fisherman's Bend under our belt, we're now looking at um, a couple of other examples, ones with one of the infrastructure projects. And again, you know, they've got to do all of the design and development anyway. They've got to do all of the data acquisition. So why not do it in a way that potentially will um, be standardised, able to be centrally stored, distributed and integrated with other data sets right from the outset and then have all of the downstream benefits of that and share it to potentially to other stakeholders. So that, that's sort of where we're trying to come from at the moment. We're very much um, focusing on standards, um, both in Victoria and nationally, um, the same standard, obviously, because we're very conscious of the fact that, you know, um, the last thing we want is a digital rail gauge problem, mm. where it's, you know, wandering around. And even with BIM, for example, you know, every time we've asked someone for a BIM file, we've been struck by how different every one of them looks. There's, you know, there's a, definitely a level of standardisation that's needed. And I think that is actually um, important leadership that government 
can provide. Um, and I think the other thing is that, um, you know, we're at this, as I said before, at this point in time where there's so much happening, um, so much investment in infrastructure, we've had, you know, the benefit of successive population and construction booms until this point, who knows what the future holds, but, um, you know, just how you can, harness, you know, intercept influence and harness that um, investment and reuse, recycle and, and share um, the data assets that are created through that work, I think is where we're focused at the moment. And then constantly circling back to think, well, what are the things that we can do as the um, custodians of these foundation data sets um, for the better betterment of everybody? Yeah. Um, last question, Melissa, and I'm going to ask you to sort of change hats for a moment. Let's uh, switch over to Anslick. Um, <clears throat> now, la late last year, um, Anslick published a document um, spatially enabled digital twins for the built and natural environments, I think, or thereabouts. Did. Catch um, your title. That's right. Now, for anyone, anyone uh, in the digital twin world in Australia and New Zealand, um, that that's that that's a key resource now that we have in the library. Um, globally, the Gemini principles are often referred to as a sort of a core foundation. Of, of thinking around digital twin and essentially um, uh, Anslick sort of took those and, and built from them and, and worked, worked with them. Can you, can you share with us um, uh, the, the, the journey there um, and sort of the, the aspiration or, you know, sort of um, w we want to embrace these, right? G give me a little, uh, give me a little sort of sense of, you know, what 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 the pathway was and sort of what the journey is from from here on yeah well look those principles um came about through ASIC because as you mentioned before the fantastic work that's being led by bruce thompson in new south wales with the western sydney digital twin um which is you know really spectacularly good work and and steve jacoby in queensland's done some really great early thinking as well so what we've been wanting to, you know, sort of sensing the sort of um, the great emerging groundswell of interest in this area and being aware of, you know, we're all big fans of the Centre for Digital Built Britain and their publications. And um, I suppose we were really keen to sort of come up with our own version of the Gemini principles for Australia and to really get in early, capture the learnings and get in ahead of the curve instead of being in the position where we're late to react and respond and we're constantly on the back foot and playing catch up. So um, it's been really good to um, develop those. And as I mentioned earlier, to work with this broad range of stakeholders who aren't our traditional set of stakeholders um, to develop them. So for us, I think, um, you know, the Anslick role and the, those principles are primarily designed to set the vision at the Australian New Zealand level for digital twins. Um, so that is, I think that leadership piece is really important to have a bold sort of statement that we're in, you know, digital twins are important to us. They're a priority area of focus. And if this is part of what you do, this is how, what the things you should be thinking about and how you can contribute to the evolution of this digital twin ecosystem. So I think that's been really, um, really important. Um, I think also just, you know, formally expressing the importance of standards. I mean, this is, you know, the spatial community, I'm a late entrant into the spatial community, but they're highly organised. Mm. It's been going for decades and they're deeply dedicated to their craft. They deeply understand the importance of um, proper data management and standards. So, you know, making sure we get that right, right from the outset to make sure that we, um, harness those learnings um, nationally and and really you know this whole leapfrog strategy around taking is it because there's a very strong culture of collaboration in Australia New Zealand the spatial sector you know it's not about all trying to outrun each other it's about taking what one does sharing it and taking that to the next level sharing that and then getting further with the same so you know, those things I think are really big strategic advantages when you're thinking about the level of transformation that digital twins can enable and the rapid learning curve that not only government, but all areas of the sector, private industry and the research community have in coming to grips with this opportunity. So that's um, part of the role I think ANSLIC plays. We've certainly expressed those priorities 
um, in our recently released strategy and they're echoed in those digital twin principles. Um, and of course, we'll be leading some important pieces of work over the coming years to really nail those um, um, in, important standard pieces to really start, you know, make sure we keep providing good visible leadership on digital twins and really stimulate, you know, the development of the capability. Um, and also working in partnership with um, private industry, which is an incredibly important part of the whole equation. And that was a big message that came through in the digital twin workshop we had in Canberra that, you know, we've got to bring everybody along the journey. Everybody's got to get sort of familiar with this technology. Um, so we're very conscious about, you know, having a future ready workforce, um, you know, having really good skilled capable providers that really help government and, you know, achieve its goals. So, um, yeah, so I think that's, um, you know, the release of the strategy was an important step in that direction. Well, um, on behalf of the digital twin community across Australia and New Zealand, if I can take license in speaking on their behalf, uh, a, a very sort of big virtual digital thank you to Anslick for sort of taking the leadership and, and publishing those principles because um, that, that's where every good journey starts with a solid foundation. So congrats to, to you and all your Anslick colleagues. Uh, and of course, that work, as you mentioned, has been sort of underpinned by, um, you know, a very small group, but have large teams behind them uh, across our state agencies here in Australia. So thank you again for that. No problem. Uh, Melissa, we're, we're sort of done here. Uh, I just want to make a final um, uh, sort of reference to... Um, by the time people listen to this uh, or watch this, uh, we'll have we'll have launched two um, new resources for the digital twin community in Australia and New Zealand, which is our um, our digital twin guidance note uh, that the Smart Cities Council uh, has published or will publish in the next thirty minutes, uh, which 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 really takes a lot of inspiration from those Anslick principles and. Um, of course, having uh, Anslick uh, be part of the re review group for that. Uh, and of course, the other one we're really excited about is the Digital Twin Hub, which is sort of like this place where we can sort of all come together as a community uh, and, um, and and share and ask questions and, and I suppose, you know, thrive on each other's sort of interest, excitement and, and knowledge. So, um, uh, so we've got a couple of those references that you made to Fisherman's Bend that are up there on the on the blog site as well as some of the videos from uh, that early Fisherman's Bend uh, work that you mentioned. So I encourage people to head to the Digital Twin Hub, which is digitaltwinhub.org. That's it for the moment. Um, Melissa, thanks so much for joining us uh, on episode six, I think it is, of the Digital Twin Sessions. It's been fun. It's been great. Uh, look forward to chatting again with you soon. Okay. Thank you, Adam. And thank you so much for everything SCANS has done to get us to this point as well. And congratulations on the launch of the Hub. I'm very much looking forward to Victoria being a strong supporter. Fantastic. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks. Bye.